This was my quite wide-ranging interview with my friend Don, who, if you don't know, has helped open theme parks and water parks from scratch. He's managed and led and operated theme parks and water parks all over the world. Currently, he's with one of Vietnam's biggest real estate and attraction developers in Sun Group. Um, this was a quite wide-ranging interview about Vietnam's theme park industry, his recommendations and best practices, observations about cultural differences, and what was most fascinating for me was his own story of making it in the industry and what he did to get ahead. And towards the end, he gives some advice for younger people getting started, one that I happen to share as well. Enjoy. Actually, so I, how I wanted to start was um, I was doing a little background research on you. And um, before you were this world famous um, director of operations at theme parks around the world, um, apparently you started as a fitness director on <laughs> Disney Cruise Lines. So wh what was that about? Um, you know, were you teaching classes? And then could you maybe um, outline how you went from there to where you are now? It looks like, you know, you took a very, um, you circumnavigated the globe and, and went, you know, to a lot of different places. Yeah. Yeah, I think it all, it all sort of starts in, in the Netherlands uh, about 15 15 plus years ago when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I had just uh, graduated high school or maybe a bit longer than so, but maybe 20 years ago, I just graduated high school and I sort of had two choices uh, because I wanted to go into sports or the military. And so I uh, was able to choose a fast track education that allowed me to uh, be a sports instructor for the military. And uh, I had an internship with the Marine Corps and uh, it was only two years. And so I got a really good practical um, sort of like almost like an associate's degree. Um, but that was that was really nice. Then I applied to be in a Marine Corps and then I got in. And while I was waiting to start, I'm like, is this where I want my career to go? Because we have a professional military in Holland. And so it's basically you're going to be there for at least five years you sign a contract you like it's a it's a proper job right mm -hmm. um, to become an officer at the marine corps and so i'm like i don't like what can i do after this hmm. i've had a blast learning about this i had i had loads of fun but maybe this is not what i want to do for the rest of my career so what do i really love to do and i love working with people i love like yeah. No, maybe not entertaining them, but but making sure everyone has a, has an enjoyable time and really really making sure that I work with people. And I thought, okay, what else works with people? And then I studied, uh, so I moved back to university to study leisure management, and I was able to do an associate's degree. And then you can pause your degree if you want, and then uh, take a year off. You don't have any more student loans, and uh, before you move into your bachelor, and I took that opportunity because I saw an ad in a newspaper, and this relates back to your question about becoming a personal trainer on a cruise ship. So the fitness director is the fancy word that Disney uses, right, to make everyone feel feel happy about themselves. But it's really a personal trainer degree on, on a cruise ship. And the way that it works is that it's all outsourced. So Disney doesn't train their own personal trainers, and every cruise ship pretty much in the world, all the big ones, they all use the same company that provides their spa personnel. So that includes the massage therapist, but also personal trainers. And so they send you over to the UK, you get two weeks of training, and then you get told, hey, we've gone to a ship, and you've got 12 hours to pack, and then you need to fly off to wherever that ship is. Mm -hmm. And so the way that they they put you on these ships is there's two things. One is the type of ship and the brand matches with your personality. And then the ship determines how good you are in generating revenue. So the best ships take the people who make the most revenue because it's a commission-based job. When I started, there was no base salary. So 100% commission. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the way that your personality works, if you're very outgoing, you might be placed on a ship like Disney 
if you're a little bit more uh, calm and more reserved, you might go on a cruise line that really targets uh, sort of the elderly population and goes around the world. And okay. so they were like, oh, we're, we've decided you're going to go to Disney based on this and this, and you're going to go to this ship based on your performance. I'm like, Disney has a cruise ship? What? I did not know. This was not part of the, the plan. Yeah. But it sounded amazing, right? I, I'd obviously heard about Disney, but I wasn't into theme parks when I when I studied whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so I spent nine months doing the contract there, having a blast, not making a lot of money, mm -hmm. but really, really enjoying my time um, traveling throughout the Caribbean. And then I'm like, wow, this is what I want to do. I want to continue to make people happy and surrounded by palm trees and fast forwards like 12 plus years this is where i'm still at i look outside and there's palm trees so yeah nice that's the, so, the short introduction sure sure thank you but so you made a lot of uh, stops along the way though so right now you're currently in vietnam um, but it looks like you have experience all over southeast asia and also in the middle east so uh, how did you go from Disney, I guess, or, uh, you know, generally from like a, a fitness position to, um, you know, directing operations at, at theme parks? So like, what were some of the steps along the way? So after I finished uh, my, my time with Disney, I went back to university to finish my bachelor degree. And at that point, I was really clear, okay, this is this is what I want. I want to do something with theme parks and I want to be in, in great places, beautiful places. And so when I had to pick my graduation assignment, I sent uh, 120 different emails out to theme parks all over the world to ask them, can I do my, my graduation, like my bachelor degree thesis here? And... I had about four to five replies, and um, one of them was from uh, was from Dubai that said, "Oh, look, we we don't have anything." One was in Korea that said, "Oh, it's going to be really tough due to translation," and one was in Malaysia um, for a company called Sim Leisure, and they said, "Oh, we we'd be interested." And so I went over there. I arrived. And within the first week, the owner sat me down. He's like, okay, what's what's the deal here? I'm like, well, I'm supposed to, as I've written down before and as what you agreed to, I'm supposed to work like at least four days a week on, um, on my assignment. And then maybe one day a week, I can help out with the company. He's like, oh, okay. Well, we really want you to switch that around and spend four days working and one day a week on your thesis. And actually we want you to work six days a week. So maybe you can just do like your thesis one day and then five days work in the company. Uh -huh. And over the first month, that sort of split. And I was working very much inside the, inside the company, uh -huh. but still able to do my graduation, um, over there and realizing that, oh, it's a great place to be because it was a small park in Malaysia, outdoor with a lot of natural attractions. So there were no roller coasters, but there was a giant slide, sure. sort of like an indoor dry ski slope. Mm -hmm. There was rock climbing, there was loads of other activities, and it was really trying to bring the, the natural experience that kids used to have in Malaysia back to life. Like palm tree climbing and those sort of things so the concept is really good it still exists it now has a theme park a water park a glamping area and so the the owner does does quite well that was a very good experience mm -hmm. but at the same time i was like okay this is this is quite small we had a, t a total team of about 80 people and so i had to go back to the netherlands to graduate Mm -hmm. And while I was back in, in Asia for a little bit of travel after I stopped that job, I uh, started to email those same 120 companies again. Yeah. And by luckily this time, I didn't have to email them all because the company that had replied from Dubai that said, oh, we don't have anything uh, a year ago now replied and said, we have a management traineeship. And so I'm like, okay, well, that's a great way to get into a larger organization. They had a water park. Yeah. And so I did the first interview while I was in Thailand and then didn't hear back from them. I'm like, okay, 
And so I sent a follow-up email two weeks later and I said, hey, I'm going to be in Dubai in two weeks because I was flying back anyway to, to the Netherlands. And I'm like, it doesn't cost me much extra to stop over. And so I stopped over in Dubai. They'd never asked me for a second interview, but I had a second interview when I came to Dubai. They were like, oh yeah, stop over. And they arranged their HR director and First question they asked was, did you come here? Did you come all the way to Dubai just for this interview? I'm like, yes. And so they were happy about that. And and I got that management traineeship in Dubai. And so I didn't even get to pick up my diploma or do an official graduation. I, I graduated and had them ship the diploma to Dubai because two weeks after I defended my thesis, I was working in Dubai in a, in a water park called Wadi Wadi in, in Dubai. Okay. So that was that was how I got to Dubai. And then about two and a half years in uh, or two, two years into Dubai, um, my, the colleagues and friends that I built up in Malaysia, one of them had moved to Legoland and they were looking for a water park manager in Legoland, Malaysia. So I uh, took that job. So I went from sort of assistant manager, what that that management traineeship was to manager in in Malaysia. Then the manager of the attractions in Malaysia left and she moved to another company and they thought it would be a good idea to combine attractions like the, all of the rides uh, mm -hmm. with the water park. Mm -hmm. And so after a year, I took on those combined positions. And after two and a half years, there was uh, a request from a recruiter to become the general manager of Indonesia's largest indoor theme park, right. Trans Studio Park in, in Bandung. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a, we had a great interview because they said, oh, look, we're, we're really going to professionalize and we're going to hire two more GMs for, for other parks that we've got developing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we'd love you to be a, a part of our, our first park here in Bandung. And then uh, there will be a larger team that will come in. Mm -hmm. And after nine months, they were struggling to find a GM for uh, the Jakarta theme park and so they asked me to actually take over that and uh, become the setup gm for that project and so right. when that when they asked me that i went to site and there was just a ground level like this was an, a, at a mall and there were no walls there was no ceiling there was no nothing so i came there just bare concrete and uh, about eight months later, we had 16 different attractions and we opened that park. And so it was a crazy time. In eight months, you said? Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was it yeah. was very rapid. And after six months, the, the chairman said, we have to open in a week. I spent three months without a single day off. Um, in the last month, if I was home before midnight, I would go to work at 8 a.m. If I was home before midnight, uh, that would be an early day at that time. So it was really just an insane situation. 24 hours, uh, contractor work on site after the first three months and and inspections, all of these, these very common things that you would do um, just to make sure, like the contractors were saying, oh yeah, we're working 24 hours and mm -hmm. you'd literally have to go there at midnight to check, are they actually having the lights on? Right. Because in the first month that they said they were working 24 hours, yeah. there are no lights. How can you work 24 hours? So it's right. you learn a lot of practical tips to understand what people are, are really doing and, and how to make things work. And right. yeah, the the Asian way of, of making things work is, is oftentimes just very rapidly. The chairman has a vision, right? It's, it's right. not just Asia, but it's, it's the family company culture. Mm -hmm. Chairman is the leader. He decides, this is my vision. This is what I want to do. And then everyone's job is make sure that happens. Yeah. Right. So that's been a really fascinating Thing to to see and to grow from the first time that I was in Malaysia with that smaller company to now being a part of a of a bigger company where the company also owns a an air like a, a part of the national airline it owns banks hotels really a much larger company with with multiple parks sure sure and so um, you went from Indonesia to Vietnam directly and then is that how you found yourself in your current position. 
Correct. Yes, I met up with my my current boss uh, a few years ago in Malaysia while I was in Legoland, and uh, he reached out because he needed somebody to be in charge of new openings. Mm -hmm. The the company here. I don't know if you want me to give a background uh, of sure. the company. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great so, to hear. Yeah, yeah, because um, many people they they often don't understand the the scope of of the group, and they're not really familiar because there's not a lot of information that that often comes out. Absolutely, and so Sun Group is really this. Yeah, yeah, or or they just they focus very much on the Vietnamese market, and so the the marketing that is very successful is the Golden Bridge. That is the key thing. But even that, sometimes we have visitors who come and they're like, oh, I didn't even know there was a whole theme park behind it. I thought it was just a bridge. And OK, we had to take the cable car, but I didn't realize the, the size. Yeah. And so Sun Group um, is a group that started in the Ukraine as as uh, a noodle sale manufacturer. They The owner and the, the chairman had studied in Russia, moved to Ukraine and sort of was part of this first wave of entrepreneurs that really started these indoor malls selling noodles, then expanding to, to own the mall, to operate, then building a staff housing, and then even building a small water park in the Ukraine before moving, moving back into Vietnam, which was the perfect timing. Um, he's friends with the, the largest um, company here in Vietnam, Vin Group as well. And so they both sort of came back around the same time with this vision of, of really wanting to make Vietnam yeah, grow and, and develop and the things that they were able to see over in, in Russia and Ukraine, bring those and develop them more than uh, what there is now and, and having good government connections and being there at the perfect time 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. They opened up Banna Hills as their first park with the first cable car going to the top of the mountain. Okay. And then they've grown from there. They specialize in three different areas, which are um, the hotels, real estate, and then theme parks. And with theme parks, there's a large variety of parks. So mm -hmm. at the moment, there's seven locations throughout Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And within these seven locations, we have some parks, that some locations that are just cable cars and are planned to be be further developed like Katba, which is a small island in the north of, of Vietnam. It's very beautiful. There's a large national park there, but that is at the moment just one cable car. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's locations that have multiple cable cars and some funiculars, usually to the top of mountains. So what Sunworld really specializes in is is to identify these beautiful, unique locations and then come up with an entertainment concept that fits within that area. And so there's some parks that are very focused on a spiritual journey, like in Tay Ninh in the south of Vietnam. Uh, there's a park that focuses on Buddhism. They've built a, a very big Buddha statue, multiple fountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started there, the first cable car opened. And now, four years later, they've got the third cable car and another cable car that is that is under development. Then the, there's also a park in the north that is uh, more about the highest mountain in Vietnam. So more about nature and mm -hmm. culturally still significant, but definitely less about the, the religion and more about just the beautiful nature that there is there. Is there. Mm -hmm. And then there's a few other parks that have uh, theme parks and water parks like in Phu Quoc and in Ha Long Bay. And then uh, the key park is Banna Hills. Mm -hmm. which all became sort of famous uh, a few years ago in 2000 and I think seven or eight, uh, they opened up the Golden Bridge. And that was really a key turning point of uh, visitors coming to Da Nang and seeing this Golden Bridge, the promotions looking really well. You can see the backdrop on my on my video. Yeah. That's that's uh, very nearby the Golden Bridge. And so that's a view you can see on good days, right? So you, you see this Golden Bridge with the hands holding it up. And, mm -hmm. and that's been really an opportunity for everyone to come to Da Nang to do that. You can basically, if you come to Da Nang and you don't see the Golden Bridge, people wonder. It's like going to San Francisco and people are like, you didn't see like, the San Francisco Bridge, like you've missed right. out on 
on something, right? Right. right. Yeah. New York and not seeing the Times Square, sure. right? It's sure. not why would you come, but you've missed a really beautiful, unique experience. And then, yeah, yeah there's an indoor theme park around it. And it's really themed as a, as a French village. So 15 years ago, obviously, the Vietnamese didn't have the resources to travel as much. And so the vision of the chairman was to, to recreate an old uh, 1700s-style French village. And so that's really beautiful. There's an authentic church. There's, yeah, it's, there's multiple castles. And it's really an impressive um, yeah yeah uh yeah view. so i actually wanted to get into this later but um now that it came up um we can talk about it now um which is that i think the the vietnamese market um situation um in terms of theme parks is different from anywhere in the world so it's essentially just like two very big players in vin group and sun world or sun group um and they have but, but what's further fascinating is that they both have like very different kind of um, orientations or like positionings where like Vin Group seems like it's very, um, uh, the theme park uh, functions as like a um, uh, anchor to a, a larger master plan or resort, um, whereas Sun Group uh, takes advantage of like the natural surroundings or you know the spiritual nature of the development and um always puts in a cable car and um so you know when you mentioned that both of them had come out of ukraine or you know somewhere in eastern europe um at the same time and then come and establish these uh that's really fascinating to me um and do you do you know when um they they came over to Vietnam and, and why they started uh, in themed entertainment. I mean, did they just see that tourism um, was going to be something important to, to the economy? I'll speak on behalf of like Sun World and Sun Group, or I, I not on behalf of, but what I think uh, based on my experience here which is that the chairman that came back here ago, if you see the pictures from Da Nang 15 years ago, mm -hmm. there was very little, I don't want to say it was a fishing village because it was, was already a, a city, sure. but it was a massive difference. The amount of bridges now that connect the beach side to the city side, it was really, it, it really went through a massive development. And I think the chairman had a really good vision saying that we have to deliver something that the people can, can do and something that they can enjoy. And so as far as I believe, the Sun Group was the first one to build the Bana theme park. And I think that's what gave the idea to other parties. And at that point, I think only Vin sort of had the resources and the size to, to do something similar. I and see. so you have this idea that Da Nang sort of belongs to Sun Group because there's, there's multiple hotel projects and the theme parks. Mm -hmm. And Vin really built a big project in Nha Trang. Those are both coastal cities, right. sort of in the center of, of Vietnam. And Nha Trang is a bit more south. But they they really wanted to deliver great um, experiences for for their uh, yeah for the Vietnamese mm -hmm. and I think that I, I don't know if it was luck or vision um, but picking out that first location in Da Nang where it was on the top of a mountain uh, beautiful inspired by the French the French used to have a colony up here mm -hmm. and so there were definitely authentic reasons to do something up here there used to be a cable car but very very old and outdated and so right. they, they i think the pitch to the government initially was we're going to replace that cable car and we're going to really try to make this a beautiful location where people can can spend their time and really enjoy mm -hmm. and so i think that when you see what what sun group did was very much trying to deliver that great experience and I think Vin looked at that and and put a, a smart business model behind that. That seemed to work also in China and say, hey, look, if we just have a larger 
community, then it's easy for people to come to the park. We can also theme the whole area. And so it, it sort of sets it apart from everywhere where there was construction, yeah. right? The the location that was built in Ukraine, like the staff housing the apartments are, are just gray blocks. And I think, I hope that what they wanted to avoid was just a whole bunch of gray blocks here in Vietnam with housing and to deliver a beautiful themed uh, place to play and, and stay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I actually uh, wanted to back up a little bit. Um, it, could you describe um, what it is your expertise is in? So like, you know, we kind of alluded to it, um, you know, in terms of like, you've had management positions and you've done operations, but um, what what is kind of the, the general body of work that um, you, you specialize in? So it, it's changing sort of over time because initially I was I was focused on on water parks. This was in Dubai. Uh, I started my career in Malaysia, right? But that was just a lot of just getting into the industry. And then Dubai was really that opportunity to go to different departments because as part of that management traineeship, I spent six months as a lifeguard three months in in admissions as acting admissions manager, and then uh, also taking on a Halloween project. So it was general management bus focused on, on water parks and really with an expertise of, of lifeguarding training, and then moving more into a wider view of management of both water parks and attractions in Legoland. Mm -hmm. And then Indonesia was really the first, well, I had a, an attraction in, in Malaysia that I opened with, with Legoland. Mm -hmm. And based on that, and I think the brand of of Legoland, I got the opportunity to move to to Indonesia, where really to build a whole park from from scratch. Um, at one point, I was the only foreigner in the theme park division. They had some foreign GMs, but it was me sitting with the local design team and uh, the foreign ride manufacturers because they didn't have anyone else. And so I had oh. to learn very quickly on how do I try to make this work? When I got hired, I was the first person they hired. And a month later, I had 14 people. And eight months later, I had 600 people, right? So it, it just ballooned. Mm -hmm. And I had to spend a lot of time learning and figuring out best practices in, in setting up that, that park. And so that then gave me the opportunity to move here and both do operations and set up. And so that's what now summarizes, I think, my expertise really to understand these developing markets, uh, both in the Middle East, but also here in Asia, where they say, OK, we don't have Disney money. We don't have the universal way of planning a park for for years and years and years. We have something that needs to go from nothing to a fully operational park in in two years. Yeah. And we need to because everything around us is moving so fast. And so I think the development, the pre-opening and the operations is is what I specialize in. And we can dive more into that because sure. here I've been able to do a lot of, of park openings now that we've got the the base of what Sunworld really is. Sure, sure. I, I would love to hear about that um, specifically with Sunworld. Um, but before that, uh, given your you know experience across so many different countries, have you... Like, have you noticed any like notable differences between uh, cultures and countries in terms of like the operations or guest experience or whatever? I, I I'm sure it also differs. Uh, it differs by um, the attraction type, but are there any kind of like generalizations that you know you can touch on? Yeah, I think. Um that when when people are not familiar with an area they think uh oh we've got europe and asia and or the us and asia and they're they're very different or the western world and the eastern world and that's very much true they they are very different but even when you dive into asia i've been lucky to work now in in three countries and you can add dubai into there as, as a fourth um, if you consider that part of larger asia but it's very different between Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I think Vietnam stands out the most there um, just because 
they've they've got a very different background to to the other two for example if you look at some of the characteristics of both malaysia and indonesia they are um they have been colonized by by western countries right indonesia by the dutch and malaysia by the english and so they they've have a Western mindset in some things. If you look at how the, the law is built up, the government is organized, some of the ways of thinking, you can see that there was a, a, a mix between these two different cultures. Mm. And each country is very unique on their own, but you can definitely see an influence there. Mm -hmm. And then you've got religion. So, so you've got the the structure of the country and what they've been influenced by, by their history, right? Um, and then also the the religion plays, mm -hmm. plays I think, a part in that, in the way that people collaborate and, and work together. You can see that mm -hmm. cultural dimensions, I think, are influenced by religion as well. And so you can see a difference in, for example, that the way that many Asian countries work uh, work is based on a group culture, mm -hmm. right? So this is, we must do what's best for the group instead of what's best for the individual. Sure. And so that means people are willing to make sacrifices in regards to their own personal situation, but it also means very practically the way that you give feedback oh, I failed a bunch of time trying to get things to change in Malaysia because my way was the Western way and, and saying that, oh, look, hey, these are the things we have to change. And yesterday I saw you do A, B, C, but really that should have been the other way around. And mm -hmm. this wasn't good. And and these are the things we have to change. Oh, wow, I'd like to celebrate this person that did a great job yesterday. And they wouldn't really respond. They wouldn't say, oh, thank you. I'm like, thank you for like saying mm -hmm. that. I feel I feel proud of what I've achieved. No. Because I singled them out both positively and negatively as part of the group, hmm. right? And so um, risk taking is another one. And the way that they are able to communicate about, about failures, whether that is something that is being brought up or something that's being hidden, hmm. right? If somebody makes a mistake, do they go to the boss and say, hey, look, boss, I'm sorry, I messed up. This is the situation. Now, how can we fix it? Mm -hmm. And so you've got so many of these small cultural um, differences <laughs> that when you understand them better, you can see why people do things. Hmm. Um, an example like that is, is in my, in my first month, I, I was told I needed to get somebody to repaint a side of the, like a, a building. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, who knows how to do this? Okay, I was told this guy knows how to do it. Okay, so I get him. I'm like, hey, can you paint this? Can you paint this wall? Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. I had a translator there. And so even the language barrier was something that we overcame. Mm -hmm. And he he walks away, I'm assuming, to get the paint. And I come back 10 minutes later and I see him painting. So I'm like, okay, we're all good. And I, on my way home at the end of the day, I see him. I'm like, oh, did you finish? Yeah, yeah, finished. And so I come back the next day and the wall is only half painted. I spent an hour looking for this guy again. And I'm like, what happened? It's half finished. Oh, yeah, paint finish. Okay, so we don't have any more paint. What, what's the problem? Oh, yeah, I don't know where the paint is. Fine. Okay. I'll go find out where the paint is. So find more paint, bring it to the guy, tell him, finish this wall. So your goal is to finish this wall. If you have ran out of paint, then you tell me and you make sure you finish this whole thing. <laughs> okay. End of the day. I see him again. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, finish. I'm like, finish paint or finish painting the wall? Yeah, yeah, finish painting the wall. I'm like, ah, good. Okay. So I come back the next day. And the whole bottom 10 centimeters of the wall is not painted because what happened was that he literally painted over all the grass that was growing up to the side of the building. And at night, the the gardening guy came and he cut down all the grass. I see. And so he he never took the obviously the initiative to like hey we should like let me let me yeah. actually move the grass to try to paint the house or tell the gardener hey cut this grass so that i can finish painting yeah and so the way of thinking is not 
okay, this is my goal and I have to achieve this goal. No, my right. goal is I do what the boss tells me, hmm. right? And this is how I understand it. And so clarifying, checking, understanding what problems there are. And even if there are problems, mm -hmm. I, would he have told me that, oh, this is a problem and we need to actually get the grass cut, mm -hmm. right? So it's a very simple example of... Yeah. The way that culture influenced things, religion, uh, location, but in Vietnam, for example, also uh, the fact that it's a it's a communist country and mm -hmm. that the way that they work is still very organized. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of, of trying to bring a form of capitalism into a communist country is really interesting to see. And I think that's where you can see that the relationships and uh, the connections that you have within the government mm -hmm. and and within the region are so important that you have to make sure that you get everyone on board everyone is again it's that group culture mm -hmm. but it's also making sure that um, when you want to develop a project that the government actually supports that and i think that a country like uh, vietnam is in a unique position because they've got one party government. So they're able to make changes and rapid changes. You mm -hmm. could see that during COVID. Mm -hmm. Wow. The, just the, the government comes out. Just, just to guess, do you know when they closed the, like how many COVID cases were in the country when they closed the borders, when they said no more international travel, we're going to close the borders. How many cases were there in Vietnam? Single digits. Two. There were two COVID cases wow. and they said, we're closing the borders, mm -hmm. right? That is yeah. one, I think, the experience that they had before with, with SARS, right, in the region. Mm -hmm. But very, that's not a democratic decision where yeah. everyone has their input and we only decide to do things until everyone agrees, right? That is, look, this is going to be a problem. This is what we need to do. Everyone wear masks mm -hmm. and the whole country wore masks. It was so fascinating to see a country like Holland, where I'm from, where everyone was arguing and worried about their, their freedoms and, and the infringement of the government, where mm -hmm. here they're like, the government knows what to do. They're going to tell us. And so this is the information. This is what we need to do. And everyone wears masks. Yeah. And after, after about six months, there was no more COVID in the country. And we had a great 2021 we mm. reopened a a park and on the first day we had 13,000 visitors wow. like no no other country was was doing that right yeah. and so vietnam was in this unique situation because of everything the way that they're structured the vietnamese not only so it's not only communism but also i think the vietnam war has taught so many people a mindset of of suffering and working incredibly hard and as long as the goal is achieved mm -hmm. then then the suffering of individuals contributes to the larger overall goal and that's more important and wow it's small things the amount like how hard people work mm -hmm. in construction the fact that there's so many women working mm -hmm. everywhere like in in malaysia you can see people cutting grass on the side of the road they're all covered up because no one wants to be out in the sun sure. and in vietnam half of them are women huh. and in in other countries you would not see that because yeah. oh like this is really tough work in construction it's the same you see women carrying loads of bricks it's not that they're doing paperwork but they're working equally as hard as the men right mm -hmm. and that is just you can see why this country has both, yeah, so much potential, but it's actually achieving those things yeah. because it has a mindset of this is what we need to achieve. We want to make Vietnam a really amazing country where we'd love to have tourists to come see our culture. And, and yeah, it's just yeah. really shows the promise that Vietnam has. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. So uh, in your experience, um, it, it seems like you've had, again, you've had experience across so many different types of attractions, um, as well as functions. Um, you know, you've done development operations. It seems like you've done project management, that kind of thing. Do you have any, uh, like, say, best practices um, for each of those kind of categories, like what people do right or wrong, you know, 
any any lessons learned that you'd like to share? Okay, uh, best practices. Okay, I think there's there's so many facets that that it's tough to give sort of. Uh, uh, one or two key best practices, but I think that when we when we break it down and you look at, for example, development, mm -hmm. I think a best practice, and I think I've seen also a challenge that some parks face is that at, at first they don't have the right base, they don't have the right research to understand what is it that guests really want. So for example, when you build an indoor theme park on a beautiful island that's known for its culture and it be and its beaches mm -hmm. that's gonna be a, a tough thing to make work mm -hmm. right and if somebody says oh this is what i want it's still important to question that and to try to have more research behind it and that's often what you can see from from these family companies especially in growing areas because there is not like I don't know if many people could explain or foresee the theme park industry how it is now 10 years ago, right? And so you are you have to sometimes rely on a vision that isn't there. And so I think combining that, that beautiful vision of like, this is where I want it to be backed up with data mm -hmm. and to say, okay, this is, yeah, we want something like this, but will it actually be feasible? Does it match with what this place needs? Mm -hmm. And I think some world does a great job with that, with these cable cars going to these unique destinations. Um, so in development, I would say, make sure that it's well researched and that you understand that it's actually going to be an added benefit. Mm -hmm. And then having, having the right expertise, uh, in the development process is important. Somebody that is willing to say, hey, are you sure? Somebody that is willing to question things. And, and in Asia, you often have to do that in a subtle way. You cannot do that directly to the chairman or in front of a group. Right. But I've been in all these companies and there is always a few people who have to trust their senior in the company that find the right time and place to have a, another chat and to change somebody's mind for the for the better and so um yeah i think from a from a development side that is really a key then when you move from development to operation in a pre-opening stage i've seen a few failures where the drive to open was more important than opening well and so when you open up a park that isn't sufficiently ready, and, and what I mean by that is that the experience is good for the guests. Yes, you might not have the full park open. I'm not saying don't open until it's perfect, yeah. but there has to be a baseline where people say, oh, wow, I'm having an enjoyable experience. I don't feel like there's something missing. Mm -hmm. Because when you open up a park too quick, just because you have your your other stakeholders or you've committed to deadlines that can ruin you for a long time it's very hard to overcome those first group of people that come in the first six months that really are going to be the first ones that get excited about your park that talk about it mm -hmm. if their experience is not good to then try to fix it because six months later you did get your key attraction open and a year later you've got everything open. People will look back on those first few months and their first visit. As, as you know, a theme park is not something that people come to regularly like a supermarket and then they can see, oh, it's getting better. We've got more right. offerings. It's actually right. now the experience is good. No, you, you, you do that very scarcely. And so you really struggle if you open up too quickly. And then hiring the right people is also very important uh, in that in that pre-opening stage. And that both works from a expertise standpoint, but also from a mentality standpoint. Uh, we had a, a big show, outdoor multimedia show that we had to open. And uh, this was at the same property where we already opened up a wooden coaster, a water park where... In all of those situations, especially the, the first project for the water park, we had this, this vision of, of finding people with the right experience. We were looking and saying, okay, who else has experience to open up a water, like to work in a water park? Almost no one. And there wasn't a budget to bring in foreign expertise or to go outside of the country. And so 
we try to get related industry experience, somebody with with large pools in a hotel. And we thought that that would be that that would be the best way. Mm -hmm. I arrived there and I was told, oh, damn, there's also somebody else that's starting in my first week. The maintenance manager of the park is starting. And so catch up with him, see if he's okay. And so I had time around 11 a.m. in the morning and I called him and no response. He called me back at 2 p.m. He said, oh, I've quit already. I'm back in, I'm back in the city. And so I met up with him at the night and he just was completely overwhelmed by the amount of things that he had to do because yes, he'd been operating pools before, mm -hmm. but never, never opened up a park, never been a part of everything was under construction. Everywhere was chaos. Everyone was just trying to get their job done. And so we really underestimated the ability for people, not just to know what they're doing, but also the ability to get things done. And with the show, uh, four years later, we we really looked at, okay, what is this person's personality? And not only, okay, maybe they don't know what they're doing 100%. They've never worked at this level. Mm -hmm. But do they have the resilience, the creative uh, thinking, the problem solving to make this work? Will they fit in well within the team? And when you don't have the, the luxury of finding people that have experience, that becomes so much more important uh, and and really a big learning learning here. And most of those people, they've stayed and they've done really well. There's been maybe one out of the 20 that we had to, maybe two, two out of the 20 that we had to say, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is not going to work. We need to demote you or you should find another place somewhere else. Sure. But the majority of people, they were very successful and they, they lived up to the challenge. Yeah, nice. It, that's that's one of the th um, things that seems to me like the most daunting, especially when you open up a a park in the middle of a market that has never had a, a, a theme park before. Um, you know, so I, how do you kind of overcome that and and um, address that challenge, like in, in terms of like educating and completely like you know, and some of the workers might not have ever been to a theme park before either. And so, you know, how are you instilling this whole notion of like the guest experience and what you're trying to translate in terms of the vision, um, the guest experience into uh, the workers, uh, you know, the staff? Well, it's a good question. And I think the answer is with great struggles. <laughs> yeah, um, makes sense. That's exactly yeah. what we had to do almost at every project. And I think the the wooden roller coaster was was the best example. Every single staff member that we trained on that thing mm -hmm. had never been on a roller coaster and seen a roller coaster before, like in, in right. real time. Like not yeah. that they were like, oh, this is scary. I don't want to go on that. No, they've right. never been into a theme park where they they've been or actually saw a roller coaster in real life like they've right. seen it on pictures like they yeah. they heard about what it is <laughs> right right and so i think a few things um that have to be done simultaneously is one to break down the information so that it's easily understood and so we had started here which Unfortunately, I think you have to do with with SOPs, SOPs that were multiple pages long, some 20, 30, 40, 50 pages of how to operate theme parks that you have to have fencing, that you have to check lap bars, right? And, and all of those things that were all written down and, and the Vietnamese culture then unfortunately lays over a a format and a level of of complexity that fits within the approval process right mm -hmm. because in in other countries malaysia and indonesia as long as it works the format is not really that important because that's up to the company to decide and there's no like government format for theme park attraction sops right sure. but here in vietnam there are formats to get things approved and so the way that SOPs here often work, um, if you don't push for it, is is quite complicated. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that you are able to translate those full procedures 
into things that are easily understood. So this is, for example, the handbooks that we've been making. That's been a massive jump up in, in quality because we're now able to teach people and we're now able to delegate that teaching to the team that when you come on board, the first the first thing that we do now is um, proper introductions. And this is something that every established park does. But I think the, the next level that we bring into that is we start with an introduction to the industry. Hmm. So this is literally explaining these are the different theme parks. Actually, you know, you can have a career in this field too, right? You, you can move from attractions to f &B because for many people, this is what you could see in Malaysia. It's a job. Mm -hmm. And an example in Malaysia was that after you could see the sick leave increase by a significant amount the day after salary got paid. Oh, the day okay. after salary got paid, there would be a significant jump in, in sick leave. I see. And so that's literally because the money is in. I don't need to work anymore. And then when you speak to somebody who's just been away for five days and they're back, and you're like, what happened? Oh, yeah, I had to take care of my family. I had to like do this, do that. And, and now I need money again. Right. Like, huh. Work money is yeah. very different from career that happens to give you also money. Mm. Right. And yeah. so trying to establish that is important. And then really making those those big procedures easy to understand. So you move from we do an introduction to the group, to the park, and then an introduction to the industry to say, this is what you're a part of. And then you move from the industry into um, the, the specific department. Mm -hmm. And then you cover all the things that are consistent between those different, uh, consistent between the different jobs within the department. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at, for example, um, Aquatics, you have lifeguards and dispatchers. For attractions, you've got attraction operators, loaders, batchers. You've got all of these job functions mm -hmm. that go within the attractions department. But you've got things that are important for everyone, mm -hmm. right? How to greet the guests, what to do if there is an incident that happens, right. um, what are the different emergency stops, when to press what, those those key principles, they apply to multiple job positions within a department. Yeah. And so you break it down and we break that down with a very nice little booklet with icons, dual language in English and in Vietnamese that also helps to develop the language. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're, that's what you do for the staff level. And then you really try to get the management to read through the full SOP so that they understand not just how to manage the business, but why. Yeah, the difference I think in the West also compared to some some Asian uh, cultures and uh, um, the way that they manage things, especially if you have very little time, is you don't get to spend much time on the why. I'd love to spend time on like, oh, this is how to check a lap bar. Why is this so important? Mm -hmm. Very often here, you don't have either the, the resources, the time, the people to explain that properly, oh. but also it's not always something that people are looking for. And sometimes by giving them the why and giving them options, right? Like, why should we check lap bars? And actually, there's a few different ways you can do it. Mm -hmm. All of those choices we remove when we do a setup for a new project and for a country that that doesn't have that experience sure. and that means that there's only one way to stop there's one way to check there's no differences and that it's not perfect mm -hmm. but that we have procedures that work for 80 90 percent of the cases it's the same and it might not be the most efficient but it's consistent mm -hmm. throughout the group and it's consistent within these different positions that it means that people don't have to think, what should I do in this situation? Yeah. Because actually years ago in, in school, the way that some uh, people were brought up is that in school, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You read from the book and you literally repeat back what's in the book. Whereas in the West, you are taught 
the book is is sort of like your guideline this is this is the source material and when you're in university you actually learn okay we should do problem solving actually there might be multiple ways of doing things mm -hmm. I had a teacher yeah. in university that didn't grade based on your knowledge. It graded based on your development. So yes. he did a test at the beginning of the year and a test at the end of the year. And your grade was made up of, of how well you developed. Mm. And there was always, there were multiple choices. And the last multiple choice was fill out your own answer. Mm -hmm. If you think you have a better way, then yeah. you fill that in. And if the answer was reasonable, he would, he would, see that as a correct answer and so that really helps you right. to develop yeah, yeah a different way of thinking but we're not always in a luxury position to do that with the staff and we try mm -hmm. to give that mindset to the managers the supervisors and so to help them understand why and when you can make decisions so none of our staff get to every one of our staff get to say we're going to close this at any one point no issue there. You can press the emergency stop. All uh, stopping, anyone can do. But mm -hmm. restarting of the ride must be done by a supervisor. If any point in the checklist isn't correct, mm -hmm. none of the, we don't have checklists that say, "Oh, if this is not correct, for example, the music doesn't function." Yeah, it's not the staff decision to say, "Oh, this is probably safe, so we're still going to operate." Right? Mm -hmm. One of the seats out of the twenty seats uh, is not working correctly. Ooh. That will never be a staff decision here at this point that a staff gets to make and say, this is probably safe. Yeah. That goes up to a higher level that we then train to a higher level. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I see. It's probably also the training process is probably getting easier now with uh, Sun Group having more and more parks, right, in, in terms of the SOPs building up. And, and so to that end, um, I, I I had the impression that you, you opened um, – one of the Sun Group parks um, and worked on it from the ground up. Um, could you talk about that experience um, and, and what, what that was like? Was that kind of like the uh, culminating experience um, at Sun Group for you? It's sort of, it's sort of both. Um, because when I came here, I was thrown straight into the opening of uh, Aquatopia Water Park, which was the, the second water park of the group, but really, yeah, a, a really large, beautifully well-designed park um, where my boss worked on the design and development uh, because he started a year before I came. So I really jumped in to try to make everything work because uh, things like the signage, there was signage design done, but the location of that signage wasn't like that was put into based on theoretical uh, locations and the landscape design wasn't coordinated with the signage design. So some of the signage was literally planted right behind a tree. Right? So it's spending a day or well, actually multiple days to walk around and say, OK, change the signage here. This signage, it's missing a back. This signage needs to be flipped. This needs to be moved. Uh -huh. So that was very practical like setting up and an opening. And now our last project uh, that that I've been working on here, the, the current project is a is a water park, a theme park, and an RD and E area in a place called Samson. Okay. So it's really got a large park that will open in multiple phases. Uh, the water park will likely open first with with phase one, mm -hmm. with beautiful design based on uh, we're moving away from a a European theme and moving more into the authentic Vietnamese story. So this is based nice. on uh, one of the cultures in, in Vietnam, the Hmong people, mm -hmm. and really trying to bring sort of animals and stories from that culture to life to bring the Vietnamese, not just an experience that is away from Vietnam, but to highlight the, the beauty of Vietnam. And mm -hmm. so yeah, for the last year and a half, we've been involved in the de development of that. And that goes from um, my boss first making a rough bubble diagram to say, OK, this is where I think the entry should go. And this is where I think the wave pool should go. Then communicating that with the, the master planner and the designers to say, OK, how do we then shape this? Then it coming back to us and and me and my boss saying, okay, what is the feedback? Oh, we should change this. This needs to be bigger. This should have multiple levels and really like 
change that developing that master plan throughout and then based on that master plan saying okay we're now going to move into the the schematic design concept and based on that schematic design we'll need to start working on our operational things so mm -hmm. that is figuring out roughly how much staff we need what are these key functions that we need what is the organization chart when are we going to bring these people in what are they going to need in order to do their job? So your operational supply and equipment list, mm -hmm. which is a list of, of a thousand plus, I think it's more than 2000 items for, for the Samsung um, parks mm -hmm. that will all need to be purchased, defining if it comes from overseas or if we can find it locally, because if it comes from overseas, there's a different department that's involved and it also takes longer if mm -hmm. there's any repeat orders that need to be done so that we can also manage the budget for next year, mm -hmm. uh, we know how much we're spending in pre-opening and also how much we're we're expected to spend in the first year. Right. And so that park is currently under under construction in the north. And so that's a that's a great way. That's that's really great because it sort of completes the circle that I started from opening in in Aquatopia four years ago to now, hopefully in in next year being able to yeah i hope that some world will will be able to continue to open that park what what, what is the park called all of the sun world parks they've uh, changed their names now to just have the sun world and then the location because oh it's been so it's it's going to be called sun world samsung but yeah. it's going to have theming inside because sort of the challenges that we face especially when we were a few years ago when they're rebranding all of the the parks is that when you've got multiple parks it's really hard to come up with a good name for that sure right if you got a theme park a water park and an rd &E area what do you call that yeah right an entertainment destination a complex a right. a resort yeah yeah a resort but the, the challenge uh, that there is is that it's not really part of a resort and if it's if it's sure. landlocked it's harder to call it a resort yeah. and um yeah i think that's an interesting challenge and so the name is just going to be called sun world uh, samsung at the moment and then each park is going to have their own name yeah so that is at the moment still uh, confidential but each park is going to have their own themed name. And right. so the complex is going to be Sun World Samsung. And then you go into the theme park or the water park, and that will be heavily themed yeah. and all will have their own, their own name. So these individual parks will have a name. It, it, any uh, new or memorable attractions or experiences um, that'll be part of that complex that you could tease so, out or, or mention? <laughs> Well, I know there's going to be uh, uh, definitely a few re well, in 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 the total park. There's going to be some um, some attractions that are going to be both Vietnam's first and both Asia first. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think for the theme park, I might not be able to say. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to sure. say uh, what is coming there, but the water park will definitely have some some Asia first uh, attractions. Nice. Okay. So as part of that, um, just curious, like what, out of all the Sun World de destinations, um, are, are there any in particular that you, you know, especially recommend? So I think that, yeah, yeah, I think Bana Hills, um, just because of the uniqueness, uh, last, uh, the, earlier this year, we were able to bring uh, the IAPA Asia, uh, a, lo a large group uh, mm -hmm. from IAPA, about 100 yeah. uh, different industry experts over to Bana Hills. And yeah. for the people who hadn't been, they were just shocked at what there was. And for the people who had been, it was a few years ago, and they were like, oh, wow, it's really evolving. Mm -hmm. And and it's really coming more together as part of a themed experience where before there was more of a, of a combination of a few different things. We're really trying to streamline both the story and the attractions experience that we offer. Mm -hmm. And there are six cable cars that go to the top. There's, there's uh, on an average day, often more than 10,000 people on a daily basis that, that visit that park. And so it's, 
I think, a really unique destination, and it shows what Vietnam can do and can offer, knowing that right. creating this type of destination would be almost impossible for many, many other countries around the world to do this in a Western country. Oh, it would just yeah. be cost prohibitive. And yeah. so I think that allows, yeah, that gives great pride to show these these wonderful projects. Um, I think Vietnam is, is well, our group is the one with the most cable cars of, of any company in the world, right? Yeah. And that, that is a cool yeah. thing too. And so the second park that I would recommend is probably Phu Quoc. Mm -hmm. Because you're you enter to the south of the island into an old Roman inspired uh, station building that has these giant stone gladiators in front of it. You go onto a cable car, the longest sea crossing uh, cable car over beautiful blue tropical water into again another tropical island that you can see a water park and you can see sort of hidden behind the jungle and all of the landscaping a wooden roller coaster that that goes through and i think yeah. that arrival experience and then when you actually do these experiences is just very impressive and yeah yeah that that really gives you a, a yeah i think a, a yeah two beautiful places to visit yeah I'd love to see them. I, I, I've seen pictures and they're stunning. So, it, so actually, you know, about the cable cars, was that like a deliberate decision on the uh, on the part of the chairman to say that we're going to specialize in cable cars? I mean, how how did that come about? With you know, is it just maybe like a function of the topography of the sites that he selected? that that brought that about but it's just yeah, very fascinating to me and and i mean there's no doubt that like the view um from the cable cars is amazing but I, i'm just curious how, how did that story come about do you know i think it 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 probably started with bana hills and the fact that there was a cable car and there was an intention of developing that region and uh when, when you look at the mountains and you don't want to actually destroy the mountains, right? That's yeah. that's uh, a, a big thing here where where we have to be really sensitive about about the nature and the beautiful locations that that Sunwald is in, mm -hmm. is that you don't have a lot of other options, right? Because you don't want to go through the jungle, right? And in places like Fukuok, where you have to see the the capacities that you would have to do by boat would just be very tough. And um, looking at parks where, for example, in, in Nha Trang, the cable car has been down for, for a few months there for maintenance, the experience to go to an island by boat is just a lot less convenient. You, you still have to queue. You still have the same capacity challenges that you would have with, with a cable car. Mm -hmm. But your experience of looking out of a little window while the boat moves up okay. and down and you can't right. run with high waves, yeah, it's not ideal. And I think that they've been continuing to have cable cars because of two things. One is the topography, like you said, it's a great way to bridge difficult terrain like water and, and mountains. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing is that it's both a transportation and an attraction. You look at the view from those cable cars and they're all stunning. It's an attraction on its own. Yeah. Uh, the example in Sapa is, is stands out for that. That is the highest mountain in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You're surrounded by all these beautiful rice paddies. And the first thing, when you go outside of the station, you go over a valley. And that valley is 180 meters deep. So you go into this beautiful Vietnamese rice paddy valley. And yeah. you're 180 meters above the, the yeah. ground level. And then you go, then then you go up, right? You, you go up quite strongly. Then you move into the clouds, right? Because it's at crowd level there. And so it becomes completely white. And then if you're, most people are lucky, then, then the cloud level opens back up and you see the top of this beautiful mountain. You see a few temples that are scattered on the mountain tops. You see a little beautiful themed funicular train mm -hmm. and a Buddha statue. And you're like, oh, wow. 
And then when you get there, you look out and you see this beautiful landscape mountain. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it, it's, it's as much the experience on the cable car as when you get off. That is, right. that is beautiful. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, cable cars are very unique in that it's like, it's, it's about the journey, right? It, it, it is, that is the experience. Um, yeah, especially here, right? Because yeah. you could see places like uh, Europe and and even South America. They have some cable cars, but it's really transportation there. Like you go above the city, you 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 don't, yeah. yeah. So, but I think here we've got luck that we we live in a beautiful yeah Vietnam's a beautiful country with a yeah. lot of nature. Yeah, great. Look, well, I, I, I want to be respectful of your time, um, but maybe kind of... I'm okay. I'm enjoying oh. uh, chatting to you. I, I wish we could reverse this, but yeah, I'd love actually, to hear more about you, but maybe we plan in another call. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was actually thinking we should have talked about this, like the fun stuff first. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I'm curious, like now you're a Vietnam veteran and, and this is not really talking about um, themed attractions, but are, are there any um things experiences restaurants anything in vietnam that you would recommend for a first-time visitor I, I i've been there but you know just anything from your experiences that you would um, recommend to um, our viewers i guess well um i think that there's just uh it's so too, tough too to, much. to yeah. give a few <laughs> points because yeah there's so much right and i think it's important to to take it all in and to try to do the authentic experiences and and what i mean with that is that oftentimes the best ben me like the the sandwiches that often have like roast pork in them or or different types of meats and and vegetables they're the best from the lady at the corner on the street yeah. that your your hotel receptionist knows and says, oh, this is my favorite in the whole city, yeah. compared to the shop that also sells them and says they have the, the best ones. And so um, I, I really personally enjoy when... Um, to, to go to a beach that doesn't have a five-star resort on it, right? Yeah. And and uh, to take a little boat that, that you're wondering if you're actually going to make it there, but yeah. brings you to this beautiful place that only the local fishermen know, right? Yeah. And then they will say, oh, what do you want to have? Well, we'll we'll buy it at the local market and we'll cook it for you. And you can do that very low budget, but you mm -hmm. can also have a authentic experience that is really beautiful there's in Phu Quoc there's a small little resort on a, on an island run by a local family and mm -hmm. that's what they do they've got these over the water villas they've got a bunch of like just dogs running around and and you just have this beautiful beach and there's nothing else there you just go yeah. there to relax you stay in this this beautiful place and it's relatively affordable and yeah. they're just happy to have you there and they're happy to make whatever food you want. And yeah, I think that's a really cool thing. So yeah. to summarize, I think food wise, uh, Ben Mi is always my, my favorite, uh, as a, as a good way to get started. Then there's, I think the second thing would be the regional dishes. Mm -hmm. So Vietnam everyone thinks of the same things, ben mi, pho, uh, maybe bun cha, and, and those types of things. But actually, each region has their own specialty. The food in the north is quite different from the food in the, food in the south. Yeah. And so if you're able to visit multiple places, mm -hmm. not just take the general best Vietnamese things that I just mentioned, but also go to Hanoi and say, okay, what is unique in Hanoi that I can't find anywhere else or yeah. is harder to find? And then you get some really cool things that yeah. are really regional instead of just countrywide. Yeah. Nice. So, <laughs> I'm looking yeah. forward to my next visit. You come. I'm ready. Yeah. I meant to ask you this earlier, but um, are, are, you know, when you, when you bring in a, when you say theme park or water park, um, you know, it brings up like a certain image to mind, but of course there's got to be regional differences and local differences in, in, 
you know, how the attractions are executed and how the guest experience is presented. Um, do you see that in Vietnam with, with your parks? And, and like, if so, what are, are those differences? Well, I see now something that I hinted at before is that I think it's very important now to switch towards more authentic uh, mm -hmm. experiences Mm -hmm. and really bring out what makes Vietnam unique. And, and whether you do that in the theming or in the hospitality, I think it's 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 important to lead now this tradition of saying, what do they have in other countries? And let's try to bring that to Vietnam. Yeah. Instead of that, now it's important to say, what do we have in Vietnam that yeah. will make this experience unique? And that is both from the resorts, but also like our our parks. Mm -hmm. And there are a few smaller operational differences in the way that that people work, for example, um, the fact that that family is so important here that there are often a bit larger groups that come and visit that, mm -hmm. that has some operational uh, impact here in, in Asia. Oftentimes people don't like to be out in the sun. It's mm -hmm. less important here in Vietnam than in um, Indonesia and Malaysia, for example. You can even see in Malaysia the difference between different groups of people, um, like the Malays, the Indians, and the Chinese, right. in regards to how okay they are with, with being outside under the sun. Uh. But yeah, that's the challenge in a water park and something that we've noticed that, that might be attributed to a bit of marketing as well is that not everyone realizes that when they come to a yeah not everyone who goes to the water park actually goes on the water park attractions it's it's very interesting i don't have hard data yeah but i'd love to see the difference between europe and and a, a country like this on the amount of people that says i went there and i didn't get wet which i think um because some people take their their elderly family with them you know right. like it's a three generation family the kids yeah. the parents and, and the grandma and grandpa and you always see at the corner usually under the shade under a palm tree or under an umbrella you see grandma and grandpa sitting like enjoying a a coffee while right. they're safeguarding the belongings of the family yeah. and and the kids have gone out to play and so we see that a lot in combination with the fact that theming here is so important and people, even if they don't do the attraction, they're mm -hmm. still happy with the experience by just walking around and seeing everything and taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And so the expectation that the guest has, mm -hmm. if I see some, some water parks in the US, they're water parks, like yeah. they're a concrete slab, there's some holes where the pools are. There's yeah. some slides and, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and in Vietnam, there would just be no way you can compete with that because it completely lacks the beauty and the, the picture opportunities mm. that, that I think Asia now is, is getting known for, but especially here in, in Vietnam. And I think that that also has um, consequences on future entries right mm -hmm. that that i think there's still an opportunity for something ip based mm -hmm. but it's going to be hard to just do a, a basic uh, water park just sure. because there is so much competition that is on a higher level and people go for that it's not just the rights it's yeah. that storytelling the beauty of the the landscaping mm. that that really plays a part in the experience of the guest yeah yeah do you see any um experiences in Vietnam where that has been executed very well like it, you mentioned the the local um the local stories and legends and like um you know the traditional kind of uh themes um is there well I I know that you mentioned that Sun Group's latest um is coming out with that but are, are there any others that um have seemed to execute that very well I think there's a lot of opportunity still for for parks to do that. Uh, recently, there was a water park in the north that opened based on traditional Vietnamese uh, legends. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and they've got some theming elements that I think would be attractive to the to the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in my opinion, it wasn't consistently executed, and I think what they lack is to try to bring that to life because level one is sort of okay. Let's let's just have very basic park right concrete slab with with rides and pools then next level is is some beautiful let's let's make it look nice yeah yeah and let's have some uh landscaping let's have maybe some statues yeah and then level three is really like an integrated story that that is consistent throughout the park the zones really like match and and walking throughout that park you sort of feel like you're on a journey and i think that that next level above that is trying to see how to bring that to life where the guests are not just passively seeing things yeah but that you actually bring that to life not just through like shows and costume characters but it's deeply ingrained with with people that you feel you're actually having a transformative experience especially in vietnam where where the fairy tales here, mm -hmm. they all have sort of a moral. They they all are about how you should behave. The mm -hmm. I've dove into the to the fairy tales in Vietnam because they're they're fascinating in a way that it's it's the fights between the mountain and the ocean, and mm -hmm. it's it always has something to learn from that you can think oh this is the right way to behave this is how i should treat my family this is how i should treat the land the country this is what's important yeah and so i think that that next that last step and the step before that instead of just having a beautiful environment and people come there to take pictures how to bring it to life is something that that is a huge opportunity that will that will need to happen because mm -hmm. more parks are beautifully themed more mm -hmm. parks will have a story more parks will become more and more authentic or move more into that fantasy world but how to bring that to life and how to get people to come away with with a feeling that oh we've we've actually like not just enjoyed ourselves but we've maybe changed is is a very high aspiration but yeah. i would love to do more than just having people say I've taken pictures, I've been on the slides and I've enjoyed my time. Like, right. This right. has really been a, yeah. Something that we'll forever remember instead yeah. of the other 10 parks that we'll do in the future. Sure. Sure. That's like the Holy grail, right? The transformational kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that here there's, there's a long way to go with the, well, not, not really a long way, but there's definitely some improvements that can be made and, in like customer service, the, the the flexibility. You drop an ice cream in Disney, and the first Disney employee that that sees that will be like, "Oh, sorry, here's a new ice cream." Right. Whereas here, it's like, "Oh, somebody dropped their ice cream." Well, I would like to give them a new ice cream, but I can't make any decisions on that. And and I see. if if I take an extra ice cream, I have to justify who is going to pay for that, how it's going to be recorded, and and mm. that is a constant struggle that I think while the mindset will need to change because of more competition, also the way of working is going to gonna change. And sure. yeah, I think that improves while we're being here and trying to push for these changes, um, yeah. but it will be a continuous process for, for the next few years. Yeah. Actually, that brings up um, a, a question I had about um, Sun Group's uh, theme parks and um, themed experiences in general is like, where is the vision for each of the parks coming from? Is it coming directly from the chairman or is there like a internal, you know, imaginary esque team that that develops these or, you know, like, I, I, you know, where is it? Where, where are the ideas emanating and like, you know, the entire culture and vision? Where's that coming from? Both. Um, the, the chairman, if you see any some world projects, I think the chairman never says, let's do something quick and cheap and easy. The chairman always wants to deliver a unique experience. And sometimes he, he knows what he wants. I think the French village was really... Uh, beautiful vision, Fuquok, um, 
and the the sunset town which is sort of a mediterranean town i think um really came more from the chairman but then oftentimes there's just the assignment of hey look there there has to be something that is going to be beautiful that attracts people unique and and yeah fits within the sun world and sun group mandate of delivering exceptional guest like guest experiences mm-hmm. So many of the projects, there have been uh, like overseas designers that have been working on on the concepts, whether that is the the Golden Bridge or whether that is the new Kiss Bridge that is being built in the south. It's a it's a bridge that that has uh, it goes around and then it splits into two different sections of which the top section Mm -hmm. almost connects, but doesn't fully uh-huh. And so you can walk over that top section and sort of meet in the middle and have this idea of the kiss bridge, which both symbolizes the love story and a fairy tale of of a, um, a very traditional fairy tale of love in Vietnam that people were separated and they need to come back together to to fall in love, but also yeah. in on the Vietnamese Valentine's Day the sun will be exactly in between those two points. Wow. And so it's not just the theme, it's also the engineering that has been very smart uh, behind that and yeah. a really cool way of, of a concept coming to life. Yeah. So it's it's a bit of both. I think the, the storytelling, for example, from Samson, it was clear with the amount of parks that we have from like both the board of directors, the the operational team, that it had to become an authentic experience. Mm-hmm. And then which experience that becomes, mm-hmm. that is something that that then the design team works with the operational team and the um the the concept designers that that are usually overseas on making making that first concept. And sometimes even the changes in, in Bana Hills, there's been two or three different concepts that are presented for, for example, Newcastle that is that is under construction now. Mm-hmm. And the concepts are quite far apart so that it's clear, okay, how do we want to move forward? But the 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 concepts will need to fit into a larger theme of, in this case, Bana Hills. It's the land of giants and fairies. And giants and fairies are things that, again, come from Vietnam. And I sure. think now tie in the Golden Bridge with the other uh, things that are there. Maybe slightly less with the with the European village, but much more with the traditional. Um, you can imagine that the giants lived in these giant castles that are being built, right? And yep. so there's ways of tying that in together. But yeah, sometimes you have to, you can start with a beautiful story and then build your park around it. And sometimes mm-hmm. you have to sort of come up with a story that fits within the, the constraints or the things that you already have. Mm-hmm. And so it's a bit of both here. I see. I see. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, it, it, is there anything else you want to you. mention? Um, uh, you feel like maybe we didn't have sufficient time or treatment on. That's really. Um... I think we covered a lot. I'm I'm going through sort of my notes, life and and work, um, difference in attractions. I think we covered. I think maybe the only thing that that I would like to share still is is just the opportunity to to be here, right? That that here in Vietnam we're part of changing the the country. And I never thought I would do anything on this scale. And and maybe as an inspirational piece to to younger <laughs> younger readers, I think that the key thing that has brought me here is just looking for great places to work great bosses and most importantly what you can learn Mm -hmm. and that learning is more important than a position i've i've never really changed uh, chased any position but i think if you look for a place where you can learn something that you're interested by you have a good boss a good work culture Mm -hmm. then that will really get you far in life. And and I've just been really lucky, I think, in all of these positions. But the 
yeah, the parts that was hard work is is the learning. And I think that as long as you do that, that that really gives you a great career.